McDonald and McMullen here with you on Birds 365. John Stolis from Bleeding Green Nation and the Eye on the Enemy podcast. Our guest for hour number one on this Thursday leading into the 49ers and Eagles. First of all, John, how's the voice? You tell me. Sound all right now? You sound oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your broadcast <laughs> voice ready to go. You sound yeah. better yeah. than me. That's for damn sure. Yeah, yeah like the how, first two how, days. How after- bad was it? Yeah, I was at like 30%. So like wow. it would have been I I was really straining to get anything audible out for a couple of days there but yeah <laughs> what do you describe building... this give me a percent on this oh we're we're point. near 90 95 98 percent I was gonna say yeah. because that's a hell of a lot better than Jody and I yeah <laughs> that's sounds like true. an actual broadcaster John Stoll <laughs> yeah. hey it's the microphone that's what that's uh, very about. good. Um, that's a shot at the, the Jacob Media equipment we have. You better be careful. Of that. <laughs> um, all right, uh, 49ers coming to town. A lot has been made of the 49ers whining, and they earned it. They they deserve it because a lot of too many guys we would have won the game if Brock Purdy had paid, which is an overstatement. And of course, in both towns, it's being made a big deal. They asked James Bradbury about it yesterday because Debo Samuel was foolish enough to call him trash. Uh, Debo's not the smartest guy who ever came down a pike. Um, what kind of an effect does it actually have on the game? It's great for us here in the media. It's great for the fans. Everybody loves it. Mm-hmm. Good, bad blood flowing under that river is always a good thing. What kind of an effect does it have when they actually kick off at 425? I think that it has some effect. To what degree, I'm I'm not sure. But I mean... We've seen it. Some players are able to take bulletin board stuff and they're able to get allowed to get themselves some sort of extra motivation. Um, I think in the 49ers case, I think they're coming into this game and you can go too far on that end. Like you can go too far in seeking revenge for losing in the NFC championship game last year and really losing in a way where they didn't think they had a fair shot at it. Um, you know, it ignores the fact that both of their lines got pushed around the entire game. Uh, so you could certainly make an argument, and I certainly get why the, why 49ers fans and why the players feel like they didn't get a true shot at it. It wasn't necessarily because anything dirty happened or anything. It was just, just the way the ball bounced that day. But I, I think that the 49ers are in danger of kind of overplaying this, of getting themselves too worked up. And I get, you know, the question that I really am, am wondering about is like, if the 49ers win this game, what does it mean for them, right? And for the 49ers, it means, hey, they move one step closer to the one seed. They kind of get a little monkey off their back. But it doesn't really – I don't think it really changes anything huge in, in in where we're seeing the Eagles and the 49ers in terms of the hierarchy. They probably meet again in the playoffs, and then we get round three. The 49ers lose this game the way they've built it up in their minds. What does that do? to them. And that's the big question I have. Like if, if the 49, if the Eagles beat the 49ers, how crushing is that giving everything we're hearing from Debo Samuel, everything we heard about last year in the NFC, there's no excuse this time. If they lose, if they come into Philadelphia and lose, and then they fall three games, there's no way they're hosting a playoff game against Philadelphia. If they lose here on, on Sunday afternoon. So um, that's, that will be fascinating to see if, if that happens. Hey, can I, John, can I jump in? Cause sure. you made a great point. I want to ask follow up. Um, I think that's spot on analysis for after the fact that the game is over, win or lose for the 49ers. But how about heading in? Yeah. Because Al Morgani almost sold me on Sunday. I was doing a show with him on WIP and he actually picked the Bills. I was picking the Eagles all along that nothing was going to be said was going to change my mind. But Al said he picked Buffalo because they were the more desperate team. Hmm. And it's a an overtime game if the Eagles have to take a field goal just to get tied and then have to go the length of the field to win. So it wasn't like the Eagles crushed the Bills. They beat them, but it was as close as you could possibly get. And Al said desperation was the reason why he gave Buffalo a shot. The way you laid it out, 49ers are certainly the more desperate team coming into the game. If they lose, yeah. they're screwed. You're right. I, I agree right. 100% with you on that. But can they win because they need it more, they want it more? I think if you, we've all been watching Eagles football for a very long time, I go back to the buddy Ryan days. You guys, I know go back further than that. And it's, we have never seen a quarterback and a head coach that seem to be impervious to that sort of thing. Like we have seen with Jalen hurts and Nick Sirianni. So yeah, I would have said any other Eagles team during any other era, any other season, the 49ers have a definite advantage coming into this game specifically because of the desperation factor. 
Just like I thought last week, there was a really good chance that the Eagles could suffer a letdown game. Short week, out of conference opponent, you know, coming off a dramatic um, energy draining win over the defending Super Bowl champions. They get their they get their revenge game back. And now you've got a short week against a, a really good Bills team that's desperate. It was all set up for the Eagles to lose. And they didn't. They didn't lose. Matter of fact, they came back and won one of the most breathtaking wins we've ever seen this franchise have in regular season play. So I just I don't think that applies to this group of players, to this team. I just don't. And they've proven it over and over again. They're so talented, and I think they are so well coached that if you get past the initial burst of energy, I think that we're going to see from the 49ers, eventually they just they're inevitable. They just start to, they hit a big play and then the line starts to take control. And then if you come in with all of that emotion as the 49ers and you start to get pushed back, you get demoralized and then the snowball starts rolling. So it can work both ways if you're the more desperate team. Mm -hmm. And I for the Eagles, I've just haven't seen anything from Jalen Hurts or Nick Sirianni that would tell me they're going to lose to another team because they have more emotion or because they're more desperate. I like that word, John. You used inevitable. That seems to be what it's been for this Eagles, with the exception of Jody's Jets. Yeah, we give everybody a <laughs> mulligan. Um, and that was uncharacteristic with the late turnover. But that was a bad first half, man. That was as yeah. bad as it gets. They were booed off the field. I got so many fire Brian Johnson comments in my social media. That was bad. And I've never seen a team that just – Really, everybody talks about it, right? Jalen made that famous quote about blushing it, but they do it. Mm -hmm. It's like they don't care. Yeah. And everybody, you watch other games. And unfortunately, I go back to that Monday night game, which everybody was poking their eyes out if they tried to get through it. And if you're having a bad game, you have a bad game. That's sort of the way it goes. With the Eagles, it's like it could be bad, 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 then bang. Big play, and as you said, the snowball starts going down the hill, and you're like, oh, here they come, the, this again. It's pretty amazing, and I, I call it relentless. Jalen Hurts is like a great cornerback. He forgets everything, yeah, forgets every crappy play. But I go back to that coaching you brought up, because I love Kyle Shanahan as a play caller and a play designer. I don't love him as a head coach. I think Nick Sirianni is a very good head coach. Jody knows I love CEO coaches. And I go back to that Kansas City game. You guys were talking about what does it mean? And Nick said all week, they're not giving their rings back. All it is is about winning this game. And I think it's the same thing with San Francisco. If they win this game, guess what? The Eagles are still NFC champions last year. Yeah. So there's only so much you can do. But I don't know if Kyle Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan can impart that to his players. I think the Eagles have a big advantage there. Yeah, I mean, after the game last year, can you imagine if the Eagles had lost in a similar fashion to the 49ers, that Eagles players would have been whining and complaining in the same way that the 49ers no. players did? It no. wouldn't have happened because that's not the culture that Nick Sirianni has, in, has established and that really the Jalen Hurts has established in that locker room. And, and that's that really – it's such a huge difference that you can't quantify, right? There's There's no – there's no metric. There's no equation for that. And football is a, a weird sport in that it really involves um, because it's it's such a physical game because it's such a grinded out game, um, and each week is 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 a battle. So you know, I I think the Eagles do an amazing job, and it really does. It's amazing how Jalen Hurts can just be unfazed by everything, good and bad. You know, he doesn't get too high in the good moments either. He's just so yeah. even keel, and he has such an ability to, at the same time, just take it moment by moment, but also see the big picture ahead to, to, to know, hey, we're, we're not playing great. And Johnny, I don't know. If you're let's be honest. The Eagles cannot continue to trail at halftime every yeah. single week. Well, that was the part, and are are you getting John's a little slow for me? I can never tell who's who's. It could be me. It could be you, Jody. It could be John. I can never tell. Uh, yeah, no. Are I you think getting breaking up? Yeah, yeah. Sandra, can you uh, try to take John out and try to get him back? I can never tell. That's the one thing about streaming. Like right. we can never tell. It might be my connection. Might be your connection. Might be John's connection. 
I don't know, but to me, he was he was chopping up. He was definitely breaking up. So let me put this to you while we try and get John back. I uh, did see a comment on the stream. The 49ers, just like the Cowboys, uh, they beat up on the bad team. But when they face the good teams, that three-game losing streak, they lost three games. No. No, they beat the They Cowboys. beat the snot out of the Cowboys. Yeah. They took the Cowboys to the woodshed and beat them silly. Yeah. And they beat the Jaguars, who are 8-3. and three. Uh, And they beat them silly, I might add. Um, the, the difference is, look, Eagles fans don't, don't, don't turn yourself into gymnastics. There are issues where they were playing without Trent Williams, who's a hall of fame player, not a pro bowl player, not an all pro player, a hall of fame player. And they're playing without Debo Samuel, who I know is, uh, enemy number one in Philadelphia this week, but he's a damn good player. And when those two guys are on the field, along with Christian McCaffrey and Brandon Ayuk and George Kittle, they're undefeated. Right. And if you're looking for a comparison, yeah, take A.J. Brown and Jason Kelsey out of the Eagles lineup. If you don't think there'd be a drop-off because those two guys aren't playing, you're kidding yourself. And that's what the 49ers were attempting to do without Debo Samuel and without uh, Trent Williams. All right, let's give Johnny Stolness another try here. Hopefully the connection is better. Uh, John, we didn't get a chance to hear everything you had to say, and now I'm trying to remember what the man. It was is. great. It, you missed. Yeah, it was. Uh, that, no, I. It, it was about. And you're right. You were talking about. You can't keep playing like this. Yeah. At at at, at halftime. And you're right. If they play like they played in in Kansas City and against Buffalo, I don't think they're winning this game. Yeah. Um. So, and I think you saw Jalen Hurts after the Bills game kind of intimate that he's never going to come out and say it, but you saw him being more self-reflective and it was, he was, I think he called it weird was the word he used. Um, they got to tighten some things up. I, so I hand them their flowers, but I think that's, that's fair to say. Would you agree? Uh, I would. And I think too, you mentioned Brian Johnson, everybody wanting Brian Johnson's head. And certainly it's been, frankly, I think Brian Johnson's first year as a play caller has gone better than I thought it was going to go. I mean, we wondered if, could he call plays? Could he figure it out? He's done one thing. He's done a very good job at, you know, changing things midstream, halftime adjustments, figuring out, hey, this didn't work in the first half. Let's try some some different things. And he's not perfect. He gets into some series where he makes some play calls. And you know, what are you doing, man? I think the big problem for this team, especially over the last couple of weeks, but in general, has been the game plan coming in. And I think that's on Nick Sirianni, too. I don't think Nick Sirianni gets enough blame. Uh, for Nick, Nick's early heavily struggles. involved in the game plan. Yeah, right, I'd and so say, if, yeah. if that's slow getting out of the gate, if they're having all kinds of issues in the first half where the offense is just, you're wondering what is the play call, nothing's working, that's on Nick Sirianni too, and and he kind of doesn't get the, the blame for that the way Brian Johnson does, but you know that has to be spread around a little bit, and Nick Sirianni has to do a better job of having a game plan that's ready and some backup plans earlier in games. Like they can't, you can't take two, two and a half quarters to figure out what's going to work. Otherwise, against a team with a with an offense as good as the 49ers, you might find yourself down more than 17-7. It might be 28 to 7 by the time you figure it out. And the thing that scares me more about the 49ers, as a matter of fact, their defense. You fall behind three touchdowns. Their defense not gonna their offense yeah. may get more, but their defense may shut you down. The Bills let you get back into that game. Their good, not great defense helped the Eagles be able to get back and tie that game. All right. Speaking of uh picking up on things early, last week, first half, when they struggled badly on offense, they tried to incorporate all three backs. That kind of I don't know where Boston Scott was back in the rotation. Austin. And his runs weren't bad. I'm not trying to point the finger at Gil. I think he tried, and he actually made a couple plays, but it didn't lend itself to the Eagles moving the ball down the field. And in the second half, they pretty much went with their lead running back, and Swift made, went off and made some great plays and the like. Do you think they do that again this week? Let's try and get everybody involved early, or do you think they go, listen, DeAndre's our best back. Why are we screwing around with this? We got to mm -hmm. give him the football. How do you think they respond with, how they distribute their running back carries this week. As frustrating as it is, I think we're going to continue to see a fair mix of Kenny Gainwell and Boston Scott. And, you know, we'll continue to look for Rashad Penny on the milk cartons and, and see where, where he is. But um, you're <laughs> He's right. <not> playing. <laughs> He's not playing. And I go, okay, yeah. all right. You guys know more than I do. Um, but, you know, with, with DeAndre Swift, I think he's more effective when um, he 
isn't toting the rock 20 to 25 times. I mean, it could be that he's really effective late in games because he's not getting overused early in games. But I think again, with these, especially these next couple games coming, coming up against the 49ers and against the Cowboys, these are two monstrously huge games. You want your best players getting the ball as much as possible. I would implore <laughs> Nick Sirianni and Brian Johnson, please use DeAndre Swift as much as you can. I understand bringing in Kenny Gainwell. If you want to have a running back in there for blitz pickups and, and the like, but he's got to be getting 80% of the touches out of the running back position coming this week. And you mix in a Boston Scott here and there. You want to give Kenny a couple of touches here and there. Absolutely. Makes total sense. You don't want to over, you don't want to wear out DeAndre Swift. But this, these two games are two games where you need your very best players to have their hands on the ball as much as possible. And that's DeAndre Swift. It's not Kenny Gainwell, and it's not Boston Scott. Um, and it's not going to be Dallas Goddard. I, I think I was talking to Jody and he's probably going to be out for one more week and then he will return at Dallas. That's the feeling I got from talking to Dallas, uh, yesterday. It's been interesting. So if you look at, um, last year when he was out for those five games, they, um, got some other people involved. Um, and this year I thought it was going to be Julio Jones's time to shine. Well, he had two targets in Kansas City. He had two receptions for five yards, uh, both bubble screens. Uh, this time it was three <laughs> three targets for one catch for zero yards on a bubble screen. They haven't gotten him involved at all. Jack Stoll, we know he caught one pass and two targets both games. He is what he is. He's a blocker. And Alameda Zacchaeus. He had one target in Kansas City, didn't catch it. He had one target um, uh, against the Bills, and it was the big play. But let's be honest, that's complete schoolyard football. That's mm -hmm. not him getting involved in the offense. That's him and Jalen making a play when things break down. And then Jody's favorite, Quez Watkins, was back. But nobody knew he was back, but he played. Um I think he is, was sharing time on the milk carton with Rashad Penny. <laughs> is is well, he's at least a little bit better. He he actually gets to play, but he, yeah, he's um, sideline. I, I I is it? Do you worry about that, or is it just like all right? They can't cover Devontae, so this is Devontae's week. So we're just getting the football to Devontae. Do people worry too much about balance? Is what I'm trying to say because early it was AJ Brown. They couldn't mm -hmm. cover AJ Brown. They can't cover Devontae Smith. So why am I worried about getting Julio Jones involved? Is that the way it should be looked at? Yeah, I know. I think, I think whack-a-mole offense is fine. You know, if, if, if Devontae, if Devontae Smith is the guy that they're leaving open so they can put two guys on, on AJ Brown, as long as AJ Brown isn't getting so frustrated that he's, you know, winging his helmet at, at some down to the ground or whatever, you know, then I think you do what you got to do. Throw to the open man, whoever that is. And if you're if you're like Andy Reid and you've set up your 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 play design so that eight different guys get a get a target and a reception within the first half of a football game, great. If you're moving the ball and you're scoring touchdowns and you're keeping teams off balance that way, that's great. You just I think you just do what it do whatever it takes to win, and you can get so lost in the oh we're not getting. I, I, it is weird that they haven't figured out a way to get Julio Jones the football other than these going nowhere bubble screens that that's they just gotta with julio jones that's not his his game at this point in his career um but i don't really know what is i don't know where he fits into this offense i don't know like is he a slot receiver it doesn't seem like he's comfortable doing that uh, is he can he be an outside guy well if you do that then you're taking snaps away from aj brown and Devonte smith which you obviously don't want to do so uh, that's been a weird fit. And, and Zacchaeus, I think when he's played, he's actually, he's made some big first downs when he gets targets. He usually hauls them in. I just feel like first half of games, they don't know where to go with the football. And that's kind of the issue is I think maybe some of these other guys are open and maybe Jalen isn't seeing them or he's not getting the protection that he needs, or, you know, you get a couple of penalties here, all of a sudden you're in first and 15, second and 15. And, you know, now the defense can sit back and, and key in on guys. And so, it's just been these last couple weeks, especially have been weird, but I don't think you need to force feed the ball to certain players, make sure certain guys get certain numbers of targets. Just if guys open, throw it. And that's, I think what they're, I think that's what Jalen's philosophy is. And it it's worked enough. You'd like to see it work a little bit more throughout four whole quarters, which we really haven't seen this passing game do yet this year, have four quarters of consistent play. All right. I want to flip to the other side of the ball on the defense, John. Um, 
way back when, during summer practices with the Philadelphia Eagles, Christian Ellis picked off a couple of passes, and uh, there was excitement that Christian Ellis could yeah. be a contributor to sure, the maybe. Philadelphia Eagles. He was a shorts warrior, correct? <laughs> now, all of a sudden, Christian Ellis filling in for Zach Cunningham, which, if you'd asked me in August, Zach Cunningham, big loss for the Philadelphia Eagles. Didn't see that one coming either, but it is a reality as of right now. Christian on Christian crime this week. McCaffrey <laughs> against Ellis. Which Christian you got? And you can't choose the lion. You must choose a Christian. I mean, if there is anybody who picks Christian Ellis in that matchup, you're you're on something. Uh, McCaffrey is an MVP candidate. He's the best player on that team. Christian Ellis is going to need help. Um, but I don't know what they're going to be able to do to help. I mean, Sidney Brown's probably going to have to jump in and provide some support there. Um, you know, it's going to be an all hands on deck thing to try and keep him under wraps. And there have been in their three losses this year, the 49ers for three losses. I know they were without a couple of uh, key players. Like you guys talked about while I was, while my internet was regrouping, um, they didn't run the ball well. They, they shut Christian McCaffrey down. That's the key to beating this 49ers team. It's not necessarily stopping Ayuk. It's not necessarily stopping Debo and, and Brock Purdy. It's keeping Christian McCaffrey under wraps in the running game. And thankfully, the Eagles have the best rush defense in the NFL. But I know that they're going to need to get creative in order to try and stop McCaffrey from, from running the ball all over them. And I don't think Christian Ellis is the guy to do that. I hope I am pleasantly surprised. I, I hope he shows up and he's more physical than we think. He's quicker than we think. He's smarter than we think for a guy of his um, ability and for, you know, his, his experience level. But that is a big matchup worry that if you're picking the 49ers to win this game, that is a matchup that you're keying on and saying that this, it's wildly out of proportion in favor of the 49ers. So that's what I was going to ask you, John. So I think you just answered it, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to, focus it in if you're sean desai and dennis hopper's looking at you i'm going old school here and say how, mm -hmm. all right what do you do hot shot what are you taking away first um christian yeah yeah um and and then it trickles down let's pretend um pretend you you shut down christian mccaffrey well then what do you do with debo and george kittle and brandon Ayuk? um it, 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 from that perspective, because you're right, the Eagles have been tremendous uh, against the run. Uh, people look at the last couple of weeks. They were a little bit shaky in Kansas City. But last week, it was all Josh Allen. It wasn't the running backs. The running backs were under three yards per carry. Mm -hmm. um, they couldn't get going at all. Um, so if they are able to shut it down, and Milton Williams is going to be back. We'll see about Fletcher. Um but still, San Francisco can just, they're like the Eagles. It's almost like the Eagles get to see how the other half lives. All right, if you shut down this, we're going to take this, and this mm -hmm. guy's a big playmaker. Shutting down the San Francisco offense has to be done the same way they did it in the NFC Championship game. You just, you've got to get into Brock Purdy's face. You've got the defensive line has to win against the 49ers offensive line. And thankfully that is one of, that is one of the that matchups. Is the that, weakness. That, yeah. that is the weakness that favors Philadelphia. And you know, we, if, if hopefully those, hopefully Milton and, and Fletch are both, are both playing and, and you can get that rotation back. So you're not forcing Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter who played heroically last week with all those snaps. And was really unbelievable, but getting that rotation going, you see it really come into effect like midway through the third quarter and into the fourth quarter when the Eagles rushers are still really fresh and the offensive line is, is wearing down. Uh, that's when, that's why the Eagles have been so good at like those closeout sacks at the end of games. Like they're just, they can just come at you in waves with fresh, healthy, talented players on the defensive line and the offensive line has been playing all game and they just can't hold up to it. And so, if you can, if you can stop Christian Ellis, then you're relying on Hassan Reddick. You're relying on uh, Brandon Graham, Josh Sweat, to get to the quarterback, to to beat the to beat their guys and make Brock Purdy uncomfortable. Because, like you said last week, Josh Allen had to make a lot of magic happen by himself. Patrick Mahomes has to had to make a lot of magic happen by himself. That's not the kind of quarterback Brock Purdy is. He he's got some he's got some movability in the pocket. He's got good pocket awareness, and he's that's definitely a strength for him. But he's not a guy who's going to, at least up to this point in his career, scramble around and get 15 yards on third and nine running the football. 
if he, and if he does it, it's a one, it's a one off. You know, it's not something that you need a spy to keep an eye on Brock Purdy, which you almost needed against Josh Allen last week. So, if you can get pressure, <laughs> if you can get Brock Purdy off his spot, then you don't need to worry as much about oh, we got to cover Debo, we got to cover Ayuk, we got to stick to Kittle. You know, we got to have you got to do those things. But if you can get to Purdy, you can mitigate and minimize the importance of having to have some kind of plan in the secondary to lock those different guys down. And that's where this game's going to be won for the Eagles, just like last year in the NFC Championship game, hitting Brock Purdy. Defensive line has to win against the offensive line in this game. Let me ask you about that defensive line. You said come at you in waves. Certainly we know about their two uh, starting defense events and Mm -hmm. BG's BG. He's going to make a big play. At some point, he's going to make a big play. He's not going to play a ton of snaps because he just doesn't. They're preserving him. They're not going to put him out there for a great majority of snaps. And then you got Nolan Smith, Mm. who it seems nobody can figure out. Is he just not developing? Did the Eagles coaching staff not have faith in him? Uh, Derek Barnett doesn't play three weeks in a row. One kind of injury, one kind of DMP coach's decision, then he gets released. What what, what does the wave that is Nolan Smith equate to this week? Uh, If he hasn't done much and he hasn't so far, I don't know that this is the week Nolan. I don't think we're calling this the Nolan Smith game. Um, I think. Then then how do you say they're coming at you in waves when it's two guys? Everybody in the National Football League rotates. Well, three. Ends, it looks, uh, Brandon. Right. Don't forget yeah. Brandon. Two and a half. My bad. Brandon. Brandon. Yeah. Only a, oh, half that's half. disrespect to Brandon. <laughs> when, well, was the last I, time Brandon you, when was the last time Brandon Graham played more than half the snaps? No, but he's that. that's not his role. His role is to close now. Then he's as, become a closer. Um, I, I will in, stand in by my sense. two and a half. If you're only playing. Oh, he's very good. He's very he good. Oh, it's a great half, but mm-hmm. it's half. No, and that's fair. And I think, you know, it's um, you would like to see Nolan Smith get more snaps, especially with Derek. And maybe that's what happens. Maybe that's one of the reasons Derek Barnett kind of moved along. I mean, there are obviously other reasons why, but make some more playing time for for Nolan and get him into the rotation. Um, Use his speed on the outside. I would love to see it this week. I'm not convinced it's it's going to be that way. And you're likely going to see one of the things we've seen from Sean Desai this year is he does blitz more. Uh, than Jonathan Gannon did. And he does get creative with with bringing uh, Nicholas Morrow in on on blitzes and, and blitzing Sidney Brown, blitzing different safeties and stuff like that. So um, that's another way to generate pressure. But you're right. It's without that, I think you have a lot of a lot of options at the defensive tackle spot. And one of the things I think we saw last week, I saw Jalen Carter lining up on the outside a couple of different times yeah. in, in the game. Oh, yeah. And Maybe he got pressure. Saw- he got Unbelievable pressure. Player, so but. he's an amazing player. And so I wouldn't be at all surprised if we start to see that a little bit more in the wake of Brandon Graham's uh, uh, Derek Barnett's departure. And Milton can do that as well. Yeah. Um, he can move outside as well. Uh, yeah, I'm a little surprised when we talk about that fourth rotate because they clearly won it. They cl- they've looked all over for it, whether it's last year with Robert Quinn. Uh, Derek Barnett originally before he tore his ACL this year, they bring Derek back. Um they're desperately trying to find that fourth guy. And I think you're right, John. They might have it. You just move Jalen Carter, give him a few more snaps outside. Move Milton, give him a few more snaps outside. For some reason, they haven't done that. And I'm a little surprised because Sean Desai seems willing, more willing to open up his mind to have movable parts. I'm a little mm-hmm. surprised by that. Um, but I, I'll say this. Typically, and we see this all over the league, not just Philadelphia. Everybody says it's a week-to-week league. So many times you see last week doesn't matter when it comes to this week. Teams play well. They play poorly. In this case, I'm a little bit worried about those snap counts against Buffalo. And as you mentioned, Jalen Carter destroyed his career high. Jordan Davis destroyed his career high due to circumstance. But it is what it is. They played a ton. Mm Mm-hmm. And this is where they have to win the game. If you look at, we were just talking. If you look at PFF, the four worst players on the San Francisco offense are the offensive linemen, not named Trent Williams. They stink. Yeah. You got to take advantage of that. Yeah. And if these guys are gassed because they played a million snaps, that that's a little bit of concern to me. Sure. But, and, and I think that could certainly be an issue. Now they've had a, they don't have a short week this week. They've been 
We've had a full week to to rest and recuperate. They're young. These are young kids. That's and, true. And so you know they're you know Jalen Jalen's a rookie. Uh, Jordan's a second year guy. Um, I remember Jordan chasing down Josh Allen last week and just gassed yeah, after yeah, was, I mean, <laughs> which was both amazing. And I was like, all right, I'm done. Yeah, uh, like, 17 miles an hour. For, yeah, don't expect anything else from me for the rest of the game, guys. Yeah. That was I left it literally left it all on the field. Um, but I think, you know, I, I'm going to I'm gonna rely, and if I'm going to be optimistic about their chances of, of beating this team, which I am, they're young. They're, they're young bucks, you know. They've, um, they, they, the young bodies heal and recuperate faster. Um, so while your point is well taken, John, I think, I, I think they'll be okay, um, given the fact that, uh, that they well, are. Well, it's funny you say that, John, yeah. because, you know, people are talking about Reed Blankenship. Rube has been on this Reed uh, Blankenship kick, our friend Ruben Prank. And he played 116 snaps, I think. Hmm. I don't worry about it at all. Reed doesn't sweat. His hair right. doesn't get it. He's 23 years old. Yeah. And I'm like, well, who cares, Rube? Who cares? <laughs> He's going to be fine. But with Carter and Davis, they're big guys. Yeah. And they played at Georgia where they rotate like crazy. They never played this level of snaps before. I do think it's a little bit different, but they are young. They should be able to do it. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I sweat Reed Blankenship none because we've seen it. Malcolm Jenkins played every snap. Uh, yeah. Special teams, every single snap, doesn't matter the defense they're in. He did it, and Malcolm was in his 30s. So I'm not going to worry about Blankenship doing it th at this stage. And I don't have a worry about the Eagles quarterback either. Here's my worry about the Eagles quarterback, John Stomas. Tell me if it should happen on Sunday. I said this this past Sunday, and I think I got somewhat of a response, at least according to my buddy Chris Franklin, who was on here with us Monday. He said he heard it in the press box the other night. I said, mark my words, Jalen Hurts will either get a tush-push touchdown or he'll throw a lengthy, important touchdown pass or he'll run in from however many yards he needs to run in, not push you and run in for a touchdown. He'll do one of those three for you. He did all three in mm -hmm. the game Sunday. And I was looking for the MVP chant from Eagle fans because they're willing to do it for Embiid at six again. And they're willing to do it for Harper at Philly's games. Well, the MVP of the NFL right now is Jalen Hurts. Why not serenade him so that the 49ers can hear it this Sunday if he makes that kind of play in the game? at the link. Will it happen Sunday? Yes, I think that will. I, I think Jalen's going to have a good game. I, I think, you know, this, both teams have had this game circled on their calendar. Um, I, I think that it's going to be an offensive game. I really do. Um, I, I think this Eagles offense can move the ball on anybody. Uh, it's I'm the offensive line. I think we would all agree has not had the kind of year that we have seen them have the last couple of years, right? There's been some some injury on the on the offensive line a little bit. It hasn't been as effective in the running game, but now we're starting to see, especially again in the second half of games, them starting to exert their will a little bit more in the run game as the games go along. And I, I, I think there's, I don't think the Eagles are going to continue to have these slow starts in the first half of games. I will be very surprised if they come out and they're down at halftime again this week, or at least if they they might be down at halftime, but they're not going to play so badly that they're getting booed off the field. And Jalen hurts. I, I, I am not going to pick Jalen hurts to have a down game or a bad game until he has one. He had one against the jets a few, you know, two months, one bad game this year. He usually finds a way to get it done. And I've just stopped picking against the Eagles. I've just stopped. I'm not picking against yeah. the Eagles. I'm not picking against Jalen hurts. That's not me being a homer. There's yeah. too much evidence to tell me that he's going to play well, that this team is going to play well. I don't know if that means they win, but they're going to play well. And so at the end of the day, I think, yeah, get, give me those MVP chance. I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah. At John Stolness, you're right. I mean, this is the glory days of Eagles football. I tell Eagles <laughs> fans, enjoy it. I mean, this this shit doesn't happen. I mean it's it's so <laughs> Patriots-like what we're seeing right now. How many, how many games did we see in the playoffs where Tom Brady played like crap for yeah. like a half? Yeah. But then he just, but then they just figured out, they exert their will. At yeah. a certain point, and you're just you look. How did the Patriots? How did they win? How did yeah. they win? That happened so much because it was just inevitable. Everybody felt it coming. That's what you're seeing with this Eagles team this year, and even going back to last year. Yeah, we all know this league's built on parity, dating back to 
Jody and I are old enough to remember Pete Rosell, parody, parody, parody. That's what yeah. they built this whole league on. 1950 is the last time. The Eagles have won 14 straight games against teams with winning records yeah. with Jalen Hurts at quarterback. You got to go back to 1950 for people to think this happened. Oh, this, this is normal. Yeah. And that's why I say, you look, you have a bad half. You can't fire the offensive coordinator. They win every game. Uh, the, you don't fire people in that situation, but I do want to bring up one guy because we could be having a completely different conversation. I'll end it here at John Stolness on X Twitter, um, read John at, at, uh, bleeding green with our buddy, uh, BLG, obviously, uh, and listen to him. I on the enemy is the Z Eagles podcast hitting season is the Phillies podcast. Um, Jake Elliott. Eagles fans might be in a panic if he doesn't make a 59-yard field goal in that weather on the open end of Lincoln Financial Field. For those who have been there, they know one the close side's easier. Mm. The open side, the wind swirls. Jake's talked about it for years. It gets really difficult. Oh, 59, crappy weather. Bang. How good is Jake Elliott, John Stolness? He's our Adam Vinatieri. I mean, when you think about the Back kinds the of Patriot comparison, very good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, that's just why there's so many parallels to me. It's like mm. if if you were, you know, if you had the Patriots in their heyday in that kind of a situation and Vinatieri comes on to kick a field goal like that in that spot, he's going to make it like the snowball game against the Raiders. He, How did he make those kicks? He made them. Jake Elliott is exactly like that. He has made he makes every kick under two minutes in an overtime. He had a huge kick in the super uh, kick in the Super Bowl to put him up by eight. Huge kicks at the end of half. Huge kicks at the end of uh, of regulation. Doesn't matter the distance. Doesn't matter the wind. Doesn't matter the rain. I mean, it's such a weapon. And I didn't. I mean, I should have figured it was going to go in. I I did not think there was any way he was getting that. Ball I didn't think upright. he was making. No that. way. No, no chance. No. And he and and he does it. And he he like he hit the balls on a line on purpose. Like. He purposefully hit the ball exactly yeah. the way it went through the uprights, knowing kind of what he needed to do in order to battle the open end and the wind and the rain and all that stuff. It is a trim. It's a cheat code what they have with with him right now. And uh, he he's ice water in the veins. He's he's our Adam Vinatieri. You feel comfortable any situation putting him out there and letting him try a kick. It is it is such a weapon to have. See, and I took the John Stolness mindset going into that one. I was on the air on CBS at the time. I said. He's going to make this because he does. <laughs> this is what he does. He makes these kind of kicks, and he did. So if we're not going to pick against the Eagles until they actually lose, I don't have to ask you to make a I learned my there. lesson <laughs> on, on Jake Elliott. But, uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Jenny, yes, always a pleasure. Glad the voice is good, except for your internet interruption. You sound great. And we, we always appreciate your insight when you jump in with us, buddy. We'll get you back up in a couple of weeks. Thanks for jumping in today. Sounds good, guys. Enjoy the game. Bleeding Green Nation, Eye on the Enemy podcast. You can get Stolness elsewhere, but make sure you're in when uh, Johnny Stolness hops on with us here on Birds 365. All right, McDonald McMullen coming back. Can I have a fun guest uh, next hour, too? Uh, we've had him on before. Clark Judge, longtime NFL writer, at one point was a San Francisco guy, 49er beat guy, national guy, Hall of Fame voter, podcast uh, for the Talk of Fame Network. Um, yeah, we still kind of cling to him as a 49er guy, even though he hasn't been a 49er guy for years. He goes back to Montana and Young. So it was a while ago when he was a 49er beat guy, but he's got a good grasp on him, and he's got a great grasp on the entire National Football League. He's going to join us coming up in about 20 minutes. I got a couple more things I got to run by, John. I'll do that when we come back here on Birds 365.